In the name of our Lord and Saviour, Johann Sebastian Bach, we pray. Hi, welcome to the Listener's Guide. The word cadence is used a lot in discussions of Western music, and it has meant different things throughout history. Its original usage stemmed from the Latin word cadere, meaning to fall. This was in reference to the fact that a sung melody, much like spoken word, generally starts low, rises toward the middle, and falls again to indicate completion. This final downward step to the last note is called the cadence. Now, since the first written music in the West was for church services, let's take a look at a short sentence from the Catholic Mass, Kyrie eleison. If I were going to write a simple melody for that sentence, it might sound like this. You can see an arc-like shape to the tune, and the last two notes fall in a proper cadence at the end of the sentence. The problem for these monks singing in the Middle Ages is that they had to sing these tunes many times a day, every day, for years. So they grew bored and, cloistered as they were, began to experiment in the medieval version of a garage band. A monk rock band, if you will. But really, we don't have enough time to talk about how these experiments in sound worked because there's so much breadth from techniques that you may have heard already. <laughs> to ones that might sound entirely new. The fact of the matter is that they eventually settled on a huge set of rules for how two melodies should be written together which music students still spend forever mastering, but which can essentially be boiled down to three points. First, the parts should be independent and unique to each other, but not too much so. Second, they should emphasize consonances, but should also feature carefully controlled dissonances for effect. And third, they should end on the same note to make cadences clear. So if our monk here wanted to invite his friend to sing along, his friend might add a melody that sounds like this. You can see that our monk's friend is generally doing his own independent thing, but clearly supports the line underneath him and ends on the same note for the cadence. Now of course, once they had success with two voices, these monks were not about to give up. They could invite another friend along to add a third voice between them, and, still following all the rules, could sing something like this. <laughs> But what about a fourth voice? This is where things get a little complicated. In order to follow all the rules, our third friend could pretty much only sing one note, and even then had to do some fancy footwork in the middle to get away with it. Plus, these voices all seem kind of high. What about monks who happen to have lower voices? Well. About the same time composers started working with these lower voices, scientists had rediscovered the research of Pythagoras, and they decided it would be a great idea to put the roots of these chords in these new bass voices. So they could invite a fourth friend out to sing all those low chord roots they love. <laughs> At this point, those of you who are inclined will probably find it very easy to recognize and label the chords, and you can probably even think of a few songs that follow them. These chords create a traditional musical phrase, which is just another word for a musical sentence that leads to a cadence. Later composers took this language and, over a few hundred years, made it more and more complicated. <laughs> Yeah. 
but you can still hear its roots in the original chant melody. Hey everybody, Steve here. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I really appreciate all of the feedback and support that I've gotten so far. If you enjoyed this, please make sure that you like, favorite, and share it. And if you want to be informed every time there's a new video here on the Listener's Guide... Oh.